from Wakefield, it's the Nolan Car Night Show, inviting you to join Nolan and his guest this week returning back to the show after two years, Zach Austin. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another edition of the show. Joining me this week, two years, uh, just over two years actually, since he last came on as one of the first 30 guests. And boy, has there been a lot going on in his life, both personally and professionally in the sports world as well. It's a distinct honor and pleasure to be spo- speaking to the play-by-play voice of the women's basketball team at URI for Learview Sports. It's the man himself, Mr. Zach Austin. Zach, how are you? Thanks for joining. Nolan, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Great to, great to be back on. Happy to talk to you. Well, it, it's as, as I said briefly before we got going here, you, you've really cemented yourself in, in URI Sports as as you all know, of course, I mean, it's your life and not my life. So it's always a treat. And I think maybe compared to others and not to knock those who are in your same position, you or I, but I think you and the experience you've had in the first person perspective on all the sports that you've involved yourself, it's certainly a treat to speak to someone of, of that mind. I, I just mentioned that it's been two years since you were last on the show. And back then you were getting your foot in the door in terms of things, covering things to a, a smaller level. And now you're you're, you're the big man on campus, sort of, or I shouldn't say sort of say, but you, you are, and you're, you're uh, the lead man on in many different spots, so congrats to yourself. Um, for, for your perspective, since we last spoke, seeing as all the stuff has changed for you, how do you scri- describe, I should say, what's happened to you at, at URI since last? Um, well, first off, I'm incredibly thankful to be doing what I'm doing right now. Um, it's not possible without you know, people believing in you um, and wanting to give you a chance. Um, So since I was last on the show two years ago, um, thankfully the world has gotten back to a more normal place than it was back then uh, at that point. So I'd had the opportunity to cover more sports um, hands-on in person. Um, And last year, uh, the 21-22 season, I was able to cover women's basketball. I went to all the home games. I called most of them one way or another whether it was um, ESPN plus or or WRU. Um, And I had a blast. I I had loved covering the team my freshman year, but getting to do even more was, was so fun. Um, I also had the chance to go to Wilmington, Delaware for the tournament that year. And again, it it was, it was almost like an addiction. I just love covering that team so much. Tammy Reese is obviously just so awesome. Um, You know, going into this year, I had, you know, no idea where the road would take me. Um, I moved up at WRU to um, FM sports director, which typically entails covering more of the men's team. So I was kind of prepared more to do that. And then uh, over the summer, I got a, a text from uh, Shane Donaldson, who uh, we all know he's um, uh, one of the associate ADs uh, of uh, new media and communication at URI. And he just said, Hey, we have an opportunity for you. You able to meet. Um, so sure enough, I go in and meet and they, they present this to me. And again, I was just blown away that, that that was something that was even possible. I'm happy we're doing it. Um, that team deserves to have broadcast for every game, a local broadcast. And I've had a you know complete blast doing it this year, my first year. Um, doing every game uh, was really fun. It was a new challenge for me. I had you know gotten the opportunity to travel and call games at the Ocean State Waves of um, the NECBL over the summer um, in, in an internship role. And I was able to carry those skills over to basketball um, on a little bit of a bigger scale. And it was also different because um, I was also calling these games alone. I also had to produce the broadcast. So it was it was quite literally a one-man show. Um, but I think that was great. It allowed me to kind of um, play around with some creativity and, and really hone in on my craft. And ultimately, you know, looking back at the year, I'm just so happy um, to have done it. I, I had a, you know, like I said, I had a blast. And I'm um, looking forward to next year. I, I think I'll be back. Um, and I have so much more I want to do with it. And I mean, we saw the news earlier today and in the, earlier in the off season. It's going to be such a good year, uh, good year next year. Well, that, that's that's something I, I'll, I'll get to before we end here today. I want to mention what you had just sort of said briefly: how the world's craziness isn't as freaking as it is. Although not maybe not sports wise, but um, <laughs> health wise, as it was last time we spoke. So for you to experience all the success post um, pandemic and COVID, where now everything's back to normal of course there's always an underlying um frightness but nevertheless it's it's sort of calm and now you're able to really experience all these things what's that been like to experience it all at a normal rate you know i i think 
you know, thinking back on it to have started doing this during the pandemic, my freshman year, and now doing it um, under, I guess, slightly more ideal circumstances, at least. Um, I think it helps because, you know, at the time I was writing a lot of stories for the student newspaper, The Cigar, and there would be weeks where there would be postponements, cancellations, COVID pauses, probably every week, multiple times a week. And it was so unpredictable. You didn't know when it would happen. Sometimes it would happen right on deadline. And I think being unable to plan for things uh, like that really helped in the future because if you can handle that, you can handle anything. Um, so when I did have the opportunity to kind of actually cover things hands on, it, it was just so much cooler. I remember my freshman year, I covered the Atlantic 10 tournament, which was played in Virginia. I covered that from my dorm room. I watched it on, on ESPN plus, and I went to the zoom press conference and I had fun just doing that. So to be able to actually see these things in person and to be a part of it, I think it enhances your experience and increases your appreciation for it as well. Um, and I think that that's a big reason why I enjoy what I do so much. Well, and you probably, although back then you had a passion for it, of course, but definitely now it, it's something you appreciate so much more that now you're able to do it so freely that others prior to the uh, graduating from the pandemic, they got to experience with that uh, craziness. You, you talked about a man that, that um, holds a lot of importance that you are to, to sort of open doors for yourself and others like you. And, and during this time, since you've sort of taken this role or not sort of, you have taken the role as the play-by-play -play for the women's program at Learfield Sports. You, you've, you've garnished, or I should say garnished, you've gathered a lot of respect and, and, and props from not just coaches here at URI, but other media members and uh, other people of the athletic director that hold an ironclad uh, grip on certain keys to uh, availabilities. For you to experience that, even just as a college student doing this, what's that like for you? And are you looking to continue that respect level post-college once you'll be you know, an adult yeah I, I'm so grateful for the all the relationships that I've built at URI um, from the top down um, you know whether it's you know uh, local reporters um, I'm thinking you know Bill Koch Ian Steele um, people like that who have uh, Will from uh, the independent guys who have started to, to gain a rapport with you know covering games to obviously Thor and, uh, and Tammy Reese and uh, Shane Donaldson and guys like Stone Freeman too and Steve McDonald. There's too many to name and, and obviously all the other students who are doing this as well. Um, what I do wouldn't be possible without you know those people supporting me. Um, I really do believe that. And it's just, you know, you sometimes you don't think what you're doing is, you know, that big in the grand scheme of things. You know, I call sports games. But when you see, you know, those people and even, you know, fans too, uh, you know, supporting you and saying good things, um, it really gives you a whole new appreciation for what you do. And I hope I can pass that on to the others who are kind of starting out as well. I'm guessing that there are probably moments during this time, but also from the beginning to now where you said, yeah, I, I, I deserve to be here, damn it, I deserve to be doing this. But then also moments that re-solidified your post college endeavors or dreams during the, the last three years that you've been at URI. The sequence of stories, maybe it was just one story that, you know, re-solidified your post-college plans or that you belonged here. Do you remember what that story was? I don't know if I have one specific story, but I, I think I know where you're getting at. Um, there's there have definitely been moments, certainly in the last year, where I, I feel at home, I guess, at URI, and I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to belong in, in the industry as well. Um, I know after some of the coaches' shows um, uh, we've had at the Muse Tavern, uh, I, you know, now that I'm 21, uh, I was able to, to catch a drink after after the shows with with some of the Learfield guys. Matt Swiss is another guy who I can't leave out. He 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 was right there with Shane from day one, uh, believing in me with this stuff. Um, guys like him and, and Bill at the Muse, and we're just taking a drink, and I'm like, wow, like. <laughs> I guess, I guess I've made it to some extent. And then um, I'll never forget this moment too. Uh, we had our, our bank with the women's basketball team on Thursday last week, which I think is a week before this comes out. Um, and uh, Thor came up to me and Thor is the best. I, I, I love talking to him every chance I get. And he said, you're part of the family now. And that really sunk in because that's not something I, I, you know, I thought about a lot. And I thought about, I'm like, yeah, I have. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's just little moments like that that kind of really give you confidence and really kind of reassure you that you're on the right path. Something that I, I look back now at 
I admire at maybe compared to back then where because you know everyone's on their own different path and they choose their own life and life choice and stuff but I look at it now and I'm sure everybody says that as you just said about Thor saying you're part of the family respecting the grind that that you've put yourself through to, to get to the level that you're at because obviously you can't just walk in your freshman year saying oh hey I want to cover the women's games every every game I want to be down in Delaware at the uh, w, uh, A10 women's basketball tournament uh, to cover it as much as you have or the culture shows for the women's team and so forth for you how important do you think that was maybe towards the beginning versus now the grind where you're only focusing on besides classwork and stuff but focusing on improving and doing the best job you can so you can be at a higher level than those in your group as well at post-college yeah um i think a big part of doing well when it comes to you know this industry and, and sports media is is putting in the time and putting in the work. It's not something that just happens. It's certainly not something that happens overnight. And it's something that I've kind of, you know, been striving for since I started, um, you know, that first year, or I guess that first full year last year, my sophomore year covering, you know, trying to get better then. I think that, you know, that, that was noticed. I think that, that made a difference for me. And, and even now, like, yeah, I, I might be, you know, traveling, doing games, but in my mind, I'm nowhere near where I want to be yet. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of what I'm trying to put my time towards now, even whether it's you know, the off season, just doing research or, uh, you know, doing baseball, softball games here and there in the spring and trying to improve, you know, my style, um, little things like that, you know, that's what it's all about. Cause you know, you can't get satisfied when you do these things, you got to keep pushing forward and, and trying to work to be better. And, and that's my goal. Do you, uh, do you think, or I shouldn't say, do you think, do you recall any moments where you say, eh, maybe I could have not, you know, rehearsed, not rehearsed, but practiced in or sacrificed this moment to do something else? Or are, we, are you pretty set in the fact that, you know, I sacrificed outside life to focus and solely grind to this level where I'm higher up than others? Yeah, definitely. I mean, being a college student, you know, you're expected or, you know, you're in your mind, you're going to, you know, have fun and all this go out. And obviously a long time ago, I knew that that's probably not going to be, you know, the entirety of my time in college. Um, for the most part, yeah, you know, you've had, you do have to make sacrifices. Even right now I'm doing that, um, you know, in the late stages of the semester, school work's starting to increase. I still have games to do. Um, that's definitely a thing. And I do think it's worth it. It might not, you know, in the moment, sometimes be like, you know, why couldn't I just, you know, take this night off and do this? Um but when you look back after, especially when you accomplish something you're really proud of, you're like, that's the time that made the difference. I do hope that, you know, I have one semester left after this. I can be a little more normal of a college student before I'm done. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. But um, I'm trying to set myself up to to have more of a balance moving forward. Sure. But it's definitely a, a worthy sacrifice, uh, in, you know, in your journey, especially starting out. For you and for you, you as mentioned, what you're doing right now, you did the pat last year or or so. You through a lot of trials and tribulations, you, you became the voice of URI women's basketball for Learview Learfield Sports. My bad. To uh to make it to this point and stage in in your life as a college student to be the play by play to be the person that says, "Oh, that's Zach Austin. He covers the women's basketball games." Um, uh, for for Lear Learview, no, no Learfield. Um, for you to be at that stage doing that this young, is this a moment where you're another moment where you're saying, yeah, this is where I should be. And this is what I'm going to expect my life to be like, if I have the chance. Um, you know, I, I name recognition is cool. It's not why I do it. And even now I, I don't think, you know, I'm that notable. I think maybe a small group of people might you know recognize my name or my voice. And I think that's cool, but um, yeah, you know, I guess it comes with, with the job and, and, you know, I still don't think, I guess, I don't think I'm there yet, but, um, you know, it's a sign that you're doing the right thing. It's a sign that you're working hard and, and making the right moves, I think. So, uh, I guess, I guess it's a good thing. I'll, I'll hope, uh, hope to keep doing what I'm doing now. Well, uh, but you also have, I'm sure have to have a sense of not irony, but, you know, acceptance in the fact that, yeah, I deserve to be at this point, but it's also a moment where you probably say, how the heck did I get here? Sure, I, I put in the work and I grinded and all that stuff, but to do that, to do so much in, in this small amount of time is certainly something that you can toot your own, own horn to. Uh, for you, you know, you've been part of this 
glory and, and blaze path that Tammy Reese ha- has led for the most part the last few years to experience it at the level that you are, where you're covering all these games right there and then you're writing about this team, you're doing radio, whatever it may be, in person or on, on TV, ESPN3, and then you're doing the coaches show with her at, at, at the location and you're talking to all these other players and coaches. What's that been like? Because obviously for myself, a fan or a student of the, at the school has experienced it one way, my parents have, but you, similar to maybe the team or other people, are experiencing it right then and there. Is that another gratifying moment? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I, I don't obviously think I didn't win games. I didn't coach games. So I, I don't feel like I made it happen in that sense, but I still feel like I was kind of part of the journey, especially with road games, because you pretty much see, you know, all the kind of behind the scenes things you don't see, you know, if you're just watching on TV, um, you know, between the meals, bus rides, plane rides, whatever it may be. And I think it gives you a better sense of, of, you know, what the team's mindset is. And I think that really helps when you're calling all every game to kind of know, I I don't know completely every time, you know, I'm not, I don't know that much, but you have such a a better idea of it. And it's just, you know, especially like winning the regular season championship, you know, you know, just how important and how much that means to them because you follow them all the way from the first game to the final game of the year. You just gain a new appreciation for, for what they do. I'm curious, though, from, from your perspective, since you've been there for, for uh, quite a while now with this team, and the last few days, they lost a few key players from the, the transfer portal. Granted, their their bench and their, their depth is insurmountable to, to most other college programs in the country. And then they just picked up somebody from Syracuse mm-hmm. um, within the last 24 hours or, or so, which is a, a definitely a, a, a markup in, in the right spot. For you to watch this team, though, that went from dormancy to – not successful, no real fan, amount of fans are going there. Con- non-conference schedule is much tougher than it is than their um, re- than their conference uh, opponents. To now they're consistently getting better year after year. You say, how the hell is this possible where they're doing well this one year, then they do even better, then better to now that this level where it's like, okay, this is expected, but also maybe not necessarily expected because, of course, you can't control every outcome. My question to you, though, is, and we saw this with Ed Cooley's teams when he was at PC before he left for Georgetown, where he was not rebuilding the teams year after year. He was reloading with transfer players and all sorts of other freshmen and that sort of scenario. Do you see any similarities from those years? Ed Cooley was here the last couple of years to Tammy Reese's ability to reload this team with talented players, not just statewide, I mean, not just from the U.S. transfers and freshmen, but also international players coming in to create the strong depth that the program has. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I I wasn't here when the team was really bad. My first year covering was my freshman year was Tammy's second year, and they were on the rise. They weren't quite where they are now, but to your point, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the reloading process has been you know amazing to watch um, for this team. I, I think the biggest, I guess, example of that was probably between last year and then this past season. Um, you know, the team lost Manu Taha and MP Fapasi. Um, they're two grad transfers, Des Elmore, um, Chanel Williams, and they also lost Marta Vargas. The only returning starter they had was Dolly Cairns. Um, and rightfully so, most people are like, well, how's this team going to replicate what they did? Um, the answer is because of Tammy and the staff, because that's that's the group that makes this work. The players obviously are talented and they win the games, but the reason that they're with Rhode Island and not somewhere else is because of Tammy and the staff. Um, obviously, they got um, – their three grad transfers last year, say, say last year, Emma Squires, Madison Addicts, Covington. They also got Tennant Magasa. Um, and they won up to what they did the year before, which nobody saw coming. I think they were picked third in the, the preseason poll in the Atlantic 10. Um, even I was like, you know, I thought they'd still be good because I knew the fact that Tammy makes this team good. Um, I didn't know just quite how good they would be. And it's really amazing to see. So now, you know, the sky is the limit. Um, I think if you doubt this team, you just haven't been watching. Sure. Um, and now, you know, look, they got D.D. Davis um, from Manhattan, who I had, I watched a lot of those Manhattan games in the MAC tournament this year. That was between the Atlantic 10 tournament and the WNIT. So I watched a lot of those games. And she's really good. Um, and then um, uh, Tisha Hyman from Syracuse, who they just got today. Um, great, great get. Tammy now has gotten an ACC transfer in each of the last five years she's been here. Which I think speaks to... Um, just how appealing the Rhode Island program is um, as well. And 
you know, actually, it's funny. I, I was trying to figure out last night who who would Tammy sign, and I actually, I actually called that we would sign Tisha Hyman. I I thought she'd be a great fit, so I'm I'm really happy she's here. And Tammy recruited her to Syracuse too before she ended up leaving. Um, and then to your point too, the international recruiting. Um, I had a I had a great conversation with both uh, Tammy and Anandi Amadou, the associate head coach, about this because he's those two are the ones that spearheaded that when they got to Rhode Island a lot of talented American players didn't want to play there. And understandably so, they, as you said, they, the program was not in a good place, but international players care a lot about the coaching in the atmosphere. And that's what they brought. So you were able to get players like Manutan, MP Fafasi. Uh, you were able to recruit players like Maya Torre, who look what she did last year after, after developing for the previous two years. Um, and players who are on the rise, like Awa Kamara, uh, Sophie Sen, you have Inez Debraz, uh, Anel Dutad as well last year, who played really well uh, in their freshman seasons. You're able to recruit players like that. Tenen Magasa, too, uh, also from France. Um, and that helps set the foundation for now. You can pretty much go after anyone you want. And it was that kind of formula that made it happen. So anytime you lose any amount of players, uh, they're able to reload and they're able to do it even more impressively than the time before. And that's kind of why you're seeing players like Dolly Cairns and Emmy Renat leave too. They're both excellent players and they played really well with Rhode Island, but now the talent level has just risen sure. exponentially since they've gotten there and playing time is just so, so hard to come by. So um, that's kind of the competition levels just increased tremendously. Well, that's what I was curious about because now the team is almost like the dream team of the U S Olympic men's program where there's, the best the best are on the team and now it's sort of hard to get playing time although you look at the depth chart and their first rotation I remember I think it was Nathan who made mention this this um when he came on that if the first rotation isn't doing it or the the, the people getting hurt the second rotation could come in and do just as well or the third rotation so it's an unfortunate thing to see players who have started the last few years for URI leave but they also realize that they're in good hands because the program has done so well with getting players that okay, you're not going to start perhaps now, but you're going to play a reserve role or a backup role and you're going to do just as well. And then one day you're going to come forth and unlike maybe the men's program the last few years, you're having players accept that and have no problem doing, which is always always a um, a good thing. Do you see that though being a problem at, at some point where it's going to bite them in the butt where they're losing a handful of players each year because the depth is too strong? Or do you think that, it, it, that's a thing that happens at every pro, top program. You know, I think that's something that you can expect when it comes to a team like Rhode Island, who now has so many talented players. Um, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, if the players are happy in their roles. Um, like, like I said, Tammy can reload and that's what she's doing now. Is that because players are leaving or is that why players are leaving? You know, who knows, but um, you know, I don't blame someone like Dolly who, who has been a starter now for, you know, about two seasons been a contributor all three years she's played not wanting to come off the bench because you know why would she she's been starting she'll probably have the opportunity to go somewhere and be you know the top one of the top players on that team and that's I think what she she should want so you know that I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing on the other side of the coin there you look at some of the freshmen that Rhode Island's bringing in this year you kind of have to give them playing time because these are players that if they don't, they could easily say, well, I want to go somewhere else and they could get time. So I think it's a bit of a balancing act, but um, I'm sure that's something that the staff knows about and that they're, they're, they're going to plan for. So at the end of the day, it's kind of about how the group meshes together. And if, you know, personally, I think they feel, feel fulfilled in the program and, and that's kind of what leads to who stays and who goes. You mentioned uh, shortly a while ago that each year the team does one step better than the year prior and last season, this past season, of course, they do great co regular season, A10 champions. They make it further into the A10 tournament and WNIT tournament. They, they they make it further than they did the last time it was over 20 years or so since the 90s. So they they're doing much better than each year, but they're still they they still are missing that you know that that big ticket item an NCAA tournament bid. Uh, or regular season sole championship for a 10 tournament. How far away do you think that this team is from that level? And do you think that they're able to stay at this successful rate without getting burnt out? That's a good question. I think because there is enough turnover from group to group, especially from the 21, 22 team the last year, I think 
I don't know if burnout's something that that might happen, but that's why you signed Tammy Reese to a ten year contract yeah. because she's going to get it done. You know, by the time that's all said and done, I think it's close. Is it next year? I mean, ideally, but um, look, two to three years from now, obviously the expectation is going to be different, and it's going to be more more of something that that's expected than than maybe a want. Um, but, you know, you look at the Atlantic 10 last year compared to this year, UMass was obviously the top dog, and now they, they lost the majority of their key contributors. So what do they look like? That might open the door for you. You still have some tough teams in the conference. I'm thinking of a, a George Washington who brought almost everyone back and got a, a key transfer, um, Aaron Durant from Boston, Boston University, who Rhode Island played in the WNIT. You have a team like um, St. Louis who's coming back. Um, they lost one key player but they have most of the rest of their team coming back st joe's has a great young core um of players so you're still going to have some competition but i think now compared to last year you look at rhode island and now i think they're the top dog i don't see you know especially with the moves they've made so far and they still have two open roster spots to, to play around with um i i really do think they're the team to beat if you look at last year's team they were very close i think there was just a few few I mean, he obviously had some injuries here and there. Dolly had to miss some games. I'm a Squires didn't play in the tournament, the A-10 tournament. But, uh, like, turnovers, I think, was one of their biggest issues. If they can clean up the little things like that, it's going to be tough to beat them. And I th- like I said, I think the NCAA tournament's on the doorstep a uh, year or two from now. Uh, definitely, definitely within reach. One thing that I admire about this year, this past season's team compared to the year prior was, of course, that game last year where they had that very long home stretch or undefeated stretch during the season, and then they lose that game. I think it was Duquesne or it might have been two years ago, and that sort of deflated their their motivation or ego, and then they end up losing first round of the 8-10 tournament after being one of the top two teams, and they sort of went from there. Now, this year, they lost that streak of wins, but then they were able to rebound very quickly in fast fashion and able to continue to do better. I think... And from my perspective, I think although it's totally nowadays with NIL and that sort of stuff, it's hard to get quality players, also players that want to contribute and stay all four years or three years to a program. But I think it's equally, if not much more difficult to keep the majority of your coaching staff all the five years they hear so far, because with the success they've had and Megan Schonacher's, you know, associate head coach, I believe, and she's attributed a great amount to the success that this program's had since she got here. And I'm sure she has got inquiries about potentially leaving to become a he- assistant head coach somewhere else at a bigger school or a head coach at some smaller school. For, for you, granted, she signed this 10-year extension, so of course the coaching staff may want to stay. But for you, what does it say about Tammy and the university's ability to keep this the core of the coaching staff together the last five years since Tammy has gone here? I think it shows a serious commitment to the program and to winning, uh, for sure. And that's a great point. You know, I am sure Megan Shonaker and Adi Amadou especially have gotten looks to potentially even move up to being a head coach. Um, but as you said, uh, Shonaker, she's, I think, you know, been a big reason why Rhodey was able to bring in Dee Dee Davis and, um, and Hyman from Syracuse um, this off season. And it sounds like she'll be on board for now. And that might be because of the extension, but I think it's because the entire staff has such a great appreciation for, for one another. And something Tammy's talked about all year long, and really ever since she's been here, and the the, you know, the other coaches would say the same thing at the banquet actually on, on last Thursday, uh, when Tammy was presented with the hardware, the Atlantic Ten Coach of the Year award. She she took it, she walked back to the, the coach's table, and she set it down right there because in her mind that's a that's a that's a team award, yeah. that's a, a coach's award. It's not something that she she personally, uh, uh, it's not something that's a personal award for her. So. Um, I think as a unit, they're, they're such a strong group. I, I definitely think, you know, as time goes on, you could certainly, you know, risk losing somebody. And I'm sure someone like Megan Shonker absolutely deserves an opportunity at some point to be a head coach. Um, but I think you'd probably ask them, they probably have some unfinished business still, still yeah. haven't won the NCAA tournament, still haven't won the Atlantic 10 tournament. So I'm um, sure there's some more goals to accomplish. But yeah, they're such a talented staff right now in Kingston. Now, and this isn't just like a person like myself saying this, but I think historically it's always been okay. The men's program did horrible this year. By X amount of years, they should be at this spot or else Archie Miller should be fired. Or David Cox didn't do this well in three years. He should be able to do this well at this point, seeing as that was the progression that Dan Hurley took. Why do you think that 
the uh, program like the women's program isn't held in that same standard even though na- nationally they're getting to a higher level they were ranked and that they were they were notified as a game of the week i think nationally on espn uh not espn plus but espn.com and they almost were in the ncaa tournament do you think it's more just the sport in general or is it maybe a, a marketing perspective where the team isn't getting that same recognition perhaps um that's a good question um you know i don't know i i think i think in general and you know i'm just it's just as my own opinion i think men's basketball or really men's sports in general tend to be more heavily scrutinized for things like that um than 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 maybe they should be or maybe than compared to women's sports um and that's why you might see like oh archie miller should fix this program within what three four years something yeah. like that um at the end of the day it's just fans expectations and, and really all all the schools are on their own timelines for that type of thing um so you know as long as as they think they're accomplishing something and all parties are happy there then you know it is what it is and if not then that's when change uh, gets made well and i i hope that as the years go on they gather a a larger fan base more than the men because it, it's right now it's more worth it to see the women's program than it is the other program and you hope that not only people come out for uh teachers day or whatever it was we were getting 3000 fans whatever the number was but you're getting every year, and I'm I'm sure over the years since Tammy's gone here, season ticket and regular season game tickets have increased statistically over the last few years, and hopefully at some point they'll be able to have sellouts. This past year, you saw them finally re- retire numbers or names, however you want to look at it, for three of you, right? The men's program's three greatest players uh, of a certain extent, Kenny Green, Tom Garrick, and Silk Owens, they were going to do three from the uh, Elite Eight team, but scheduling, I guess it didn't work out. Surprise, surprise. Um, looking at the up there, there's Michelle Washington from the, I think, 96 from the women's program. There's Robert Carruthers and a few others. Tammy Reese in the short five years or four years she's been here, is her number or name already retired in the rafters? Is Tammy's number retired? Yeah, or name, however you want to, you know. I mean, I think, you know, when it's all said and done, assuming that she, you know, plays out the entirety of her contract, which it sounds like she wants to be here. So, um, sure, I think her name certainly should be in, you know, some kind of ring of honor, things like that. And I certainly think there should be more you know, women's players, especially from this era up there. Um, and kind of go back to your point about fans real quick. And there's certainly been a growth of that. I, I've seen that since even I've been here. Uh, beginning of last year, you have maybe, if you're lucky, 300 to 500 fans. Now it's at a point where you're consistently, at the very least, at 1,000. You get up to the 12, 1,400 mark, and it's just been incredible to see how strong the fan base is. But, you know, I'm hoping in the next few years we'll see some numbers go up there. I know um, I know they, that this team didn't win, you know, regular season championship, but I'd love to see uh, number 31 for Manu go up. I'd love to see number two for MP go up to the rafters. Um I don't know if Megan Shoniker's number is up there, but it should be yeah. uh, for what she did even before that. And I think you might see more and more of that. But um, yeah, I'd love to see more love, love in that respect for for the women's program. Now, as mentioned, this was the first year of the Archie Miller era of year I basketball. And preseason, they were picked, I, I believe, middle of the road of the 810 conference. And obviously that didn't end the way that didn't go the way it went as they were second to last behind or above Loyola Chicago. That was a new addition to the conference. From your perspective, you, you covered, I'm sure, your fair share of men's, men's games this year as well as maybe years past. What was your take on the change in terms of end-of-the-year results of this program from their preseason pick? Um, you know, I think it's tough to predict where a team's going to finish after, you know, big coaching change and a lot of, of – turnaround with the roster um i'd say probably at least from the fan perspective it was probably an underwhelming year but i think at the end of the day year one of archie miller with rhode island was never going to be you know a spectacular year so i think it's one of those things you just got to kind of look forward and hope year two is better um i don't know enough about the new players they got where i can give like oh yeah they'll be a lot better next year i i have no idea um that's certainly what they're hoping for um but yeah, it takes some time. And I think, you know, in the games that I did cover this year, which weren't a lot, I was at, I called five of them and I was maybe at a handful of others. 
uh, especially the games I called, they were very close. They, yeah. they were a competitive team. They played tough against good teams. They lost to VCU at the buzzer. They came back from, I think, 12 or 13 down against a UMass Lowell team that finished second in the America East. They came back from down 14 to a LaSalle team that came back in the A-10 tournament and got revenge, and they played well uh, in that in that tournament. So, And Texas State, too, gave them a run, but they, they stayed in until the end. So um, even Providence, with if you take out, I think it was the 17 nothing run, that's a close game. So yeah. um, they, were, they were, I guess, so it seemed like at times they were really close, and a big problem was consistency, and they also sure. didn't really win on the road. You can't <laughs> – if you don't win on the road, you're not going to go very far. Yeah. Um, so I think if they can, it will be a very different group still, obviously with, with a lot of players leaving and a lot of new additions. But if you can put those little things together, you know, consistency, you know, late game situations and obviously playing better on the road. So those are some of the big things. And you, yeah, you'll see a step in year two, but it's it's hard to predict when you first, first get all those changes, how things are going to go. And it just didn't go maybe the way a lot of people thought. Well, and you also, and I agree with that wholeheartedly, especially the the how much they were in the game. And you saw last year with Cox, and not not to disparage him, he, congratulations to him, of course, be, being named associate head coach at, at Maryland after the great year that they had. But you saw last year where they'd be up 10, 15, 20 points leading to the half, and then by the end of the game, they're losing, they lost by 5, 10, 15, 20 points, and they seemed deflated. With a few minutes left of the second half, whereas this year they're into it. They at least the majority of the players know that hey, this year isn't going to be great. We're going to lose a lot of games, but we are we care about the program, at least the core players, and we want to compete and bring back relevancy to this program. Now, oh, during the year, I believe in January, they lost Joseph at Biolo to an injury. I don't know if it was an- broken ankle, whatever it was. They lost him, of course. They lost Freeman uh, with his uh, incident and. A few players have left to the transfer portal. She ish he committed to Pitt, and uh, I don't think they had any decommits uh, this year, at least. But they may have had one, but I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure. They they lost a few players to the transfer portal. Uh, injury to one. Uh, um, uh, Roy Stewart's um, teammate from Canada um, redshirted. So they had some stuff that wasn't expected of this team. Now that, that the dust has settled, they're bringing, they're bringing players that recently just brought a few. They got brought a guy from Quinnipiac that destroyed them earlier in the season. They brought a few other key players that help them. Now that this team has had dust settled, dust settled, I should say, and Archie is building the team with his guys, how much of a burden does that take off from his shoulders in terms of expectations next year, even though they won't be extremely better? I do think there's still a lot of expectations, especially now that year one is, is done with. But I think to your point, having a full off season to recruit as opposed to being hired and having to kind of scramble and do things right away will benefit this team to an extent. How how much is, is to be seen? But yeah, you know, you had uh, Femina Redshirt, Joseph Abelau did not play very much. And when he did, he looked good. Uh, if he can come back, he'll look good. The transfers they've gotten seem... Uh, impactful you know how well will they fit together I think that's a big question uh, in year two and the other thing about last year's team is they're very young I think some of the players they brought in have some solid experience but also at the point where they can still develop and and give you a couple good years at least so um, you know the expectations are up but I think you know Archie you know now is probably a little more comfortable you know in Kingston and and again getting his guys uh, recruiting the people that he wants and his staff uh, wants I think that will benefit them in year two. Now, as we said, they were predicted last year to to end middle of the pack in terms of A ten the A ten conference. That didn't happen, of course. Do you think this year is more realistic to finish in the middle of the pack or near the middle of the pack, or is it just another example of you, you can't really predict those things? And it's sort of whatever happens, you hope hap- the best happens. Yeah, I think again, I don't know enough to to give an accurate prediction, but I I think it, it's it's a matter of can you keep up with the other teams in the conference? You've seen what. Uh, you know, VCU is doing right now. And some of these other teams, um, they're all making huge portal additions. And that's the reality of college basketball, especially in college sports now, is every team is making big moves. Um, it's a matter of can you compete with those teams? I think if if Rhode Island's additions uh, prove to be you know really helpful and, and give this team a boost and, and can put them neck and neck with some of these teams, they have a real chance. But, uh, you know, it's just a matter of where do you fall compared to everybody else? I know Loyola has committed a ton of players yet but they look like a team that will you know get significantly better so that's you know you were right there with loyal yeah. at the end of last year so can you compete with a team like that can you be better than that team and then from there 
uh, the next group, uh, can you, can you beat a team like LaSalle next year consistently just climbing the ladder until, yeah. until you're really able to compete with the top echelon of teams in the A-10. Well, and I, and I think it was Adam Bernstein who I had on a few weeks ago who mentioned this and I'm sure Nathan made an example as well. I can't remember that was even farther back, but talked about Fordham men's, the men's basketball program for Fordham. They weren't picked to be top of the tier and they, make it to the finals of or semifinals of the A-10 tournament. So you, you never know how the season goes. Everyone at some point, even good old fashioned old dog wants to leave a legacy wherever they are or end up. So w- when they leave somewhere, I should say, what's Zach Austin's legacy at URI? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I hope it's somebody that uh, really cared about, you know, the work he did, uh, someone that uh, was, you know, carrying it and, and put good time into it and also, you know, left a, a positive mark on the program. Um, I'm also hoping, you know, and specifically in relating to uh, my role now um, that, you know, if and when that gets passed on, that it's in, you know, in an improved spot and that I help it grow to whatever extent that may be. Um, but, you know, Rhodey's my home. I, I love it here. And I hope, I hope that, uh, that um that feeling can be shared amongst others and i hope i can pass down what i learned too i think that's the biggest thing is giving back because like i said earlier in the show um i wouldn't be where i am if it wasn't for the people that helped me and that list goes on and on i i I try to mention as many names as i can remember but if i can be that person to somebody else even if it's just one person i i I think i'll have have done my job here so um i guess kind of uh leaving leaving you or i a better place to, than where i left it before we end here today again i want to thank you zach for taking the time to come do this during your busy life as you're getting ready to join the real world and see how fun that is i want to end on a little segment i did last time called the one word challenge so what entails with this is i'll throw out a few names of people places and things that have some connection to my guest this week being zach austin he has to do his best to say a word or two or even a sentence whatever he cares he's the best so he can do what he wants the best comes to mind when he hears this so are you ready I guess so. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. First one, Kingston R.I. Home. Kenny Jim. Uh, legendary. Good five cent cigar. Uh, where I got my start. Learfield um, Sports. Uh, amazing opportunity. Uh, Tammy Reese. Uh, energetic. And last but certainly never least, Zach Austin. Um, someone who's just really passionate about sports. <laughs> Well, I can certainly attest to that. I, I want to thank you, Zach, for joining us this week and, and taking the time to sort of recap the last two years since you were last on. And now, you know, you really can come on and say what you've been up to and all the good work that you've been able to bring to the table and really showcase your ride to the highest standard that it should be consistently. So again, thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to be on. And if you ever want me on again, I'd be happy, happy to make another appearance. Well, when you're big time, when you're a sports anchor at some station or working for ESPN or some other news sports station or you're on the radio, whatever it may be, you're definitely coming because you'll be probably one of the more bigger celebrities that I'll have on. Uh, Is there anything that you want people to look out for for you right now that you can still put out there or in the future? Um, I'll probably have a quiet summer, but you might see some stuff from me. I'm trying to increase my, my Twitter content. I think that's something that would, that would certainly help me out, especially going into next year, uh, which by the way, if you do want to follow me on Twitter, my, um, handle is at Zach Austin underscore URI. I'll probably be posting obviously URI women's basketball content, maybe some stuff from the A10 too. just anything I find interesting that I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I expect to be back next year. Um, We'll see. I, I'm really excited for, for the team regardless. Um, I'll be doing a lot of fall sports as well um, for, for ESPN+. Plus. You'll see me doing soccer and volleyball. And you might uh, you might see me on the sidelines of football games too. So uh, stay tuned for that. So, so uh, listen to this, folks. This is what you want to do. As he just said, follow the man on Twitter, damn it. And so you don't miss out on stuff because if you do, then your ass is grass. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, you're, you're just, you're going to miss out on a whole lot of great content. I follow him on Twitter. So do a bunch of other people. And if I do, because of course I bring the be- second best content besides himself for this podcast, um, jokingly, of course, for myself, but nevertheless, follow him on Twitter, social media galore, because you're not going to want to miss out. This guy's continue exponential rise to the sports media world. Well, if you didn't enjoy this episode, because I'm surprised, I'd be surprised if you didn't. 
Follow on Twitter, Nolan Clark Knight, Instagram, Nolan Clark Knight Show. Subscribe, comment, share all that fun jazz here on the visual and audio platforms as well, because who doesn't like hearing my beautiful voice on the audio platforms as well? Because if you do that down the, lo- down the road when this becomes super big and Zach then becomes this big time person on ESPN covering the NBA Finals or the NCAA tournament for March Madness down, down the road as um, – as uh, Jim Nance did, you're going to say, holy shit, I should subscribe back then. So subscribe, comment, share all that fun jazz I just said. Do us a favor, please. It'd help out. And in the words of Johnny Carson, the DM talk shows, certainly like this, I bid you all a heartfelt good night. Till next time when we talk again.